We've been in this series, this is our second week. It's a little series of messages, just three weeks long, called The Heart of Worship. And it's because many churches do things on Sundays that they call worship services or worship gatherings or worship something. On our sign out front, it said time till next worship event, because we can't figure out what we're going to call it. But here's the thing, it's, we still call it worship something or other. And when you turn on the Christian radio station, if you happen to turn on the Christian radio station, you're going to hear them play music. And when they talk about the music, they're going to talk about it being worship music. And if you have a friend and they go to church and you go to church, you'll sometimes ask them about their church and they'll say, oh, my church is great. The worship is excellent at my church. Or, oh, my church is kind of dry. The worship is a little boring. Or my church is crazy. The worship is loud and I have to wear earplugs or something like that. And you know what they're talking about. They're talking about that segment at the beginning of the gathering where there's music before the dude gets up and starts talking like I'm doing right now. And so we do this thing and we begin to associate worship with the music. And we're not going to do that anymore. We're trying to address what worship really is. And so we're dealing with the heart of worship. And last week we talked about how the heart of worship begins with a devotion to God's word. Because if I really believe God is the most important thing in the world and the most important thing in my life, I'm going to pay attention to what he says. And I'm going to want to hear it. Today, we're going to move on into another category of worship, something else that's at the heart of worship I want us to know. And it's something that is completely countercultural. It's completely uncomfortable to us. It's completely outside our frame of reference, outside our comfort zone. And I think once we get to it, you'll realize it is outside our comfort zone. In fact, it's my goal that by the end of our time today, you have the sense that you can talk to any one of your friends this week about the church experience you had today, and they will ask you, did you go to church or something like that? And you'll say, yeah, I went to church. It was weird. We had this weird thing going on because it's outside our cultural understanding. It's outside the way we work. In fact, I'm going to start by letting you know a little bit about how I work by way of confession. I have a sin to confess to you. Sometimes... I yell at my kids. Sometimes, I'll just tell you how this works. Um, I have an office in my house. There's no, no room here for me to have an office here. So, you know, we've got this green room that's partially storage, partially conference room, partially something else. It's, it's just a mess. And then we've got all the kids' rooms and stuff. And then we've got this big room. And so there's no real place for me to really use as like an office here. So I maintain an office in my house. Now, the problem with that is that every now and then there are vacation days where my kids don't go to school. And when my kids don't go to school, that means my kids are in the same building as my office. And even though they've got all kinds of things that should keep them busy, for some reason they like to keep each other busy. Um, this is how it works. Okay, so I'm in my office, the door's shut, the walls, are, I'm surrounded by the walls. They're on the other side of the wall and I hear something like this. <laughs> And usually, I maintain my composure through most of it. You know, I need to be the, I need to be the calm, controlled one in this situation, right? So I, I get up off of my chair, I open the door to my office, and I walk out of the office, and there's something that happens in me. In the 10 feet it takes me to get from the door of my office to the crying child, where, where the conversation turned into an argument that turned into something, I don't even know what, that ended up with someone crying. And then, of course, there's the report that comes to me once I get there. He did or she did or something along those lines. And there's noise and there's something that happens in me in the 10 feet that from the door of my office to the crying child where I realize something. I must gain control of the situation. And the control that I exhort in the, the control that I exert in this situation is directly related to the volume of my voice. And so I let it go. Because I believe if I I believe that I'm going to lose control if I don't lose my voice. You know, that there's this moment there where all of a sudden I feel like my control depends on my volume. 
And this is the way the world has taught us to behave. The world has taught us that when you begin to lose control, your response is to use power. When I begin to lose control, my response is to use force, power, something to strengthen me. For some of us, it's raising the volume of our voice. For some of us, it's shifting into a totally different language that our parents never taught us. Or maybe your parents did teach you that language. Or maybe it's maybe your friends, your, the locker room buddies, or their Navy bros or something. You, but you, you shift into a completely different language, and then that language gives you power and enables you to feel stronger. And, and some of us, it's even physical. But we get to that place where if I'm losing control, I feel like I need to exert power. And the world has taught us that that is the way things work. But when we look at our Savior, when we look at Jesus, we find something that is completely opposite. We find a guy who is on the verge of losing control. The night before he goes to the cross, he is on the verge of losing control. He is in a few minutes going to be kissed by a close friend who is being followed by a troop of soldiers who are going to capture him, carry him away, flog him in the Roman way, 39 lashes with a leather whip embedded with glass and stone that'll tear the flesh off of his body. And he will be hung on a cross with nails running through the most sensitive parts of his body, not because that is a great way to kill people, but that is a great way to not kill people. See, crucifixion doesn't kill people. It's the fact that this guy is up there for so long that he eventually, his his muscles begin to give out and he ends up suffocating under the pressure and the weight of his own body. And crucifixion wasn't invented to kill people. It was invented to put them on display until they eventually died. Jesus is just about to go through that. And the only reason he's going through this whole situation is because his father said, listen, I've got a plan. I've 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 got a project. And I need you to do this for me. And so he comes to earth. And on the night before he loses all control, does he feel the need to exert power? Well, this is what he says. In prayer, he says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. This cup referring to all the stuff that I'm going to experience tomorrow. All these things that I'm just about to encounter. Take it from me. Yet, not my will but yours be done. This is an amazing moment of worship. Because if you recall, our definition of worship from last week is simply this. Worship is what happens when I, by words, attitudes, and actions, express God's supreme value. And so Jesus, when he says, not my will, but your will be done, that's worship. That's him saying that above all other things in this world, what you want is more important than what I want. You are of supreme value in this world and to me. And he says those words as an act of worship. It's also expressed later on in the Apostle Paul. In the book of Philippians, we find Paul is in jail and he is a day away from death, or at least he might be. See, at any moment, the Romans could come in and say, okay, this is it. This is the day. You're done. We're going to kill you. He's in jail. He's writing to a a church that he founded in a town called Philippi. And he's writing them this letter. And the opening chapter of the letter says, I don't know if I'm going to live tomorrow or not. But he says in chapter one this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's about ready to lose control of his whole life. And he doesn't even exert any power at all. He just simply says, if I live... It's because of Jesus. And if I die, well, then I win because I'll be with Jesus. And then in chapter four, he says this, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You see, there's a kind of worship that is truly countercultural. It's a worship that goes beyond the things are losing control. I need to gain control. It's a worship that says, my life is out of control, and I'm okay with that, because I know who is in control. 
and I've learned the secret of being content. I don't need to exert power because there is one more powerful than I who is ready to exert power of his own. I want to take you to a couple chapters in Psalms, a couple passages in Psalms. The first one is long. It'll take me about five minutes to read through the whole thing. It's a long chapter. It's one of my favorite Psalms, and it's not a Psalm that's arranged in an easy to understand fashion. Uh, Some of the Psalms, for example, if you went to one of the life groups this last week, you might have encountered the Bible study on Psalm 19 where it was very structured, it was very organized. There's an outline you can follow in Psalm 19. There are different stanzas and there are different breaks, and it's very easy to track with them. But in Psalm 37, what you find is something else. You find a whole bunch of themes, four themes, in fact, that get intertwined. And each theme keeps showing up over and over and over again. And so I'm just going to read it out loud. And if you have a Bible that you can mark up, mark things that interest you. Or or, um, if you have a, a... one of these Bibles, electronic things, you can tap on the thing and add colors to it. But I'm just going to read it. It's going to take a little while. I hope that maybe you follow along with me. It's one of my favorite Psalms in the Bible. Psalm 37, four is like a life verse to me. But I want to take you to this Psalm because there are four themes that speak very clearly to what we're talking about today. David wrote this and he says, do not fret because of those who are evil. Or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him in this and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose ways are upright, but their swords will pierce. 